Hi, my name is Kai Thomas, and I work at Young Roots Farm, a farm situated between Montreal and Ottawa that focuses on bringing youth from the city uh, to the land to learn about their food systems, to reconnect with nature. And uh, I run some land-based programming there, as well as uh, build infrastructure for the farm. Um, today, I'm gonna go over how to build this planter box that I designed. I think it'll be very well suited for uh, an interior space or a balcony or a backyard. It has three levels to it, one on the bottom, which would be uh, very good for storing topsoil or other gardening materials or potentially having a small uh, plant. Uh, the main uh, box in the middle is nearly two feet deep and would be very good for growing something such as tomatoes or uh, kale or any other uh, plant that requires a, a deeper root depth and it has a top layer as well from which you can trellis uh, plants um, or hang other uh, pots from. So I think it uses vertical space really well and I'm going to use it as an example to go over some basic carpentry skills as well as design. I think that building skills in general are very good for anybody interested in food sovereignty because with some basic skills you're able to make full use out of the space that you're working with and especially if that space has constraints such as uh, access to sunlight, um, amount of space that you're working with, uh, features of the land that are particular to your location. A lot of times you're not going to be able to buy something um, that will be suitable to your needs and so uh, I encourage anybody interested in food sovereignty to, uh, to really practice your, your building skills because it pairs really nicely together. And uh, this box, for example, if you bought every material new, such as the lumber and the fasteners, you might spend $100. Um, but if you were able to salvage some materials, you could spend a lot less than that. So it potentially makes your projects a lot more affordable as well if you're able to build them yourself. Uh, so without further ado, let's get to it. The first step to any construction process is design. This can be as simple as chatting with a friend or colleague and searching Pinterest for ideas. Consider what you want your project to accomplish, what purpose it's fulfilling. I would also recommend going to whatever physical space your project will occupy. Take a tape measure and imagine what the thing will look like. Take notes on the dimensions that you have. Doing this will save a lot of time in the long run as you may be able to design something that works in the space you have. My main considerations for this design was affordability and optimizing space. What I was seeing online is that a lot of DIY planter boxes are more for the looks and I wanted to build something that would hold a lot of soil and make full use of the space it took up. So it would be a viable tool for growing food and not just a pretty box. If you don't find a pre-existing set of plans for what you want, you will have to make one. This can be as simple as sketching on paper, or if you're familiar or want to learn a software such as Google SketchUp, you can do that too. Drawing it out helps me imagine all the materials and tools I will need for the job. Based on my sketch, I figured that I needed 30 pieces of 1x4 lumber at 8 feet, exterior wood oil, screws, plastic sheet, and landscape fabric. In terms of tools, I would need a drill, an impact driver, a measuring tape, a speed square, pencils, a saw, a paintbrush, a staple gun, a knife, and safety glasses and ear protection. I had all but the lumber in the farm shed, so I headed to Home Depot to buy the wood. At the Home Depot, I chose regular 1x4x8 lumber. A lot of designs on the web use cedar, which is a nice looking wood, and also water and rot resistant, but it's much more expensive, so I went with the regular lumber and decided to apply the exterior wood oil stain to give it more water resistance and longevity. When selecting your lumber, there's going to be a lot of variation in the wood. You'll rarely find all perfect pieces, but don't be afraid to get in there and select the nicest looking and the straightest pieces that you can. It will make things a lot easier to work with. 
Make sure you have a good working area. If not outside, then somewhere you'll be able to clean adequately. If you don't have a pair of sawhorses to cut on, consider making them out of 2x4s. If not, you can always use a pair of old milk crates or something like that. The circular saw is probably the most dangerous tool I'm using for this project. If you've never used one before, I'd recommend having someone experienced show you. And if that's not an option right now, consider working with a handsaw. You can get a good handsaw from a hardware store and do pretty much any cross cut with it. From your design, you'll want to come up with a cut list. This is an extrapolation of the design or sketch that details the quantity of pieces and measurements of wood that you'll be cutting. I like to keep my cut list with me as I work. Measuring accurately is an essential skill. Here I'll show you how to do a carrot mark. For the planter box, I'm cutting the post at 6 foot 11 and a half inches. Holding the tape measure at one end of my piece of wood, I pull my tape out to my measurement and make two marks pointing to the measurement. Then I take my speed square and hold it tight against one side of the board and line up the perpendicular edge to the point of my carrot mark. This gives me a perpendicular line at my desired measurement. All of the pieces in this design are perpendicular cuts except for the top pieces of my planter box which are cut at 45 degrees. The speed square is a useful tool for many reasons and this is one. Placing the pivot point of the speed square firmly to the wood, you can bring the bottom of it out and line up the long side of the speed square to the edge of your piece of lumber at your desired angle, in this case 45 degrees. Hold it in place firmly and make your mark. For this cut, I am measuring long point to long point of the cut, so I hold my end of the tape against my long point, mark my measurement, transfer that measurement to the edge of my piece of lumber, and then mark my angle cut. The next step is cutting. Whether you're using a power saw or not, your aim is to cut on the waist side of the wood and allow your blade to touch the line that you have made, disappearing it but not cutting over it. This will ensure an accurate cut. If you are using a power tool, remember to allow the blade to turn at full speed before making contact with the wood. This will diminish the risk of your saw kicking back as it cuts into the wood. Also be sure to extend the piece that you're cutting off over your cutting surface so that it will fall to the ground. You can secure the wood on your cutting surface with your free hand or with clamps. Be sure to cut decisively through your piece of wood. This will ensure it falls freely and does not bind your blade. For a task like this, where you have to make multiple cuts of the same length, a miter saw or chop saw would make the task go quicker. If, like me, you don't have access to one, don't be discouraged. Take your time and try to enjoy the work and learn all you can with the tools at your disposal. Here, I make all my cuts and pile them so that they are easy to count. I check my cut list frequently and make sure I'm staying on track. Always remember, uh, if when using power tools, to wear safety glasses and ear protection. The next step is staining. This is an optional step. If your planter or any other wood project is interior, you won't have to worry about staining your wood. Alternatively, you could choose a wood such as cedar, as I mentioned, which is naturally rot resistant, though it is more expensive. I found staining the wood took more time than I anticipated, both in applying the stain and in waiting for it to dry, so that is something to consider. I let it dry overnight, so this was a natural point to pause in the project. So in a brief interlude, I'd like to introduce you to a historical carpenter and builder who I draw a lot of inspiration from. His name is uh, Solomon Northup. You may know of him from his book, 12 Years a Slave, recently, or a few years ago, adapted into a film of the same name. The film, of course, focuses a lot on the suffering of Solomon and his compatriots as they endured slavery. But in reading the book, I found that Solomon actually uh, found it important to detail a lot more information on his skills as a builder and the ways that he used those skills to remain strong, resilient, and innovative during his time of enslavement. For example, he talks about how he came up with a way to transport lumber that he was felling. Um, at one point in the book. At another point, he spent several pages detailing how he invented and built a fish trap that he would leave in the bayou 
during uh, his days in the field. And at the end of the day, often he would come home to fresh fish, an extra source of protein that he would use to keep himself and his friends strong during the hard periods of work on the plantation. And so when I think about resilience and food sovereignty, uh, somebody like Solomon Northup really stands out to me as somebody who really made the most of their surroundings and used their skills as a builder and as a carpenter to uh, keep up their strength, their well-being as part of his struggle and his journey um, out of enslavement. And so I give a deep nod to Solomon Northup and all the other uh, builders and carpenters who have used that innovation and use that uh, spark to uh, uplift themselves and become food sovereignists in times of great uh, struggle. Once the stain had dried, I ended up moving all my materials to the location that the planter box would stay, and I started assembling. The first step was to assemble the post, which consists of two 1x4s fastened together with screws. I pre-drilled all holes with an 8-inch bit to avoid splitting the wood. Following the posts, I installed the side pieces to the planter box. I marked the top and bottom of the box directly onto the posts and laid the slats in place and fastened them. My screws were an inch and a quarter and the lumber is only a half inch thick, so I made sure to angle all my screws so they did not come through the other side of the box. I repeated this process for all four sides of the box. I added a batten that spanned the long side of the box diagonally to add strength. At this point I fastened the top pieces onto the posts and stood the entire assembly on four feet. The bottom of this box has a detail for drainage. You'll see two pieces of wood on each side angled downward toward the center of the box and there's about an inch and a half of space in the middle. Since this detail would not be seen, I used some scrap cutoffs of 2x4s and pressure treated plywood to build it. But you would also be able to use the same 1x4 pieces that the rest of the assembly incorporates. Following this, I installed the bottom shelf. It consists of two 1x4 pieces that are fastened to the short side of the bottom of the assembly and several slats that are fastened on top of these pieces at 3 inch spacing between the slats. Finally, I lined the inside of the box with plastic sheeting. I used a pond liner, but you could use any type of plastic sheeting. I folded it against the corners and stapled it into place. I punctured several holes in the middle drainage opening at the bottom of the box and then trimmed the excess sheeting with a knife. I repeated the process with landscape fabric and then the box was complete. This was the finished product. Happy building and happy food sovereignty. Peace.